turn in your Bibles tonight to the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We'll begin our reading in verse 5 in just a moment. Give you time to turn to the scripture reading. Paul began in this chapter in the first verse, and we're not going to read those first few verses, but he spoke about there being no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And uh, I mentioned a little bit about uh, the condemnation that was upon mankind uh, from Adam's day and how that Jesus didn't come to condemn the sinner but to save the sinner. And so Paul tells us that uh, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ which really underscores what Jesus said. In the fifth verse, we read, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. That is, that it's something that separates us and our fellowship from God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit, and you'll note that Spirit here is capitalized, denoting the Spirit of God, do mortify, and the word mortify simply means to subdue or suppress the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Tonight I'd like for us to think about, as Paul mentioned here, the difference in the uh, outward flesh, the outward man, and the inward man, and think about as children of God, and, and Paul uh, bore this out in these verses that uh, we just read, especially in verse 8, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So tonight I'd like for us to think about for a few minutes what church members should do. And uh, I know that we could go back and uh, to a time in the Old Testament in the early church when the church was growing rapidly that there was much opposition to the church. And as the persecution and uh, the opposition came, it seemed as though that they uh, grew stronger in their faith and Eventually, that uh, they began, they were dispersed abroad to many different places to uh, carry the gospel to uh, the different parts of the world and fulfill the great commission that Christ gave to the church, to go into all the world and, and to preach the gospel. And uh, they were having a good time in the church of Jerusalem. Many souls, they were souls were being saved, not just one or two a year, but they were having thousands of souls being added to the church in just a short time. And, and you can just imagine their cups were just running over, uh, spiritually speaking, and enjoying those wonderful services in the church there. But the Lord didn't want them to just remain there and enjoy being in that one little church, or in that one church. He wanted them to expand the gospel to the different regions of the world. And so if they weren't willing to do it on their own, he sent persecution to cause them to be dispersed. 
And of course, we know that uh, the gospel spread from Jerusalem to various parts uh, of the world in that day, and the gospel is still being preached in uh, places throughout the world today. And I'm thankful that it is. But as we think about what church members should do, I think about this often, especially when I go and, uh, and it's not just in church that we're to do this, mind you. But it's in our everyday living in this life that we're to be friendly to others as people of God. And you say, well, what do you mean? Well, we've all maybe been to places where we didn't feel welcome. Whether it be church or whether it be on the job or uh, whether, uh, wherever it may be, that we really didn't feel welcome. And that uh, there's an old song, old country song that came out many years ago that said, everybody's got to be somewhere, but I'd rather be anywhere than here. Have, have you ever related to the words of that song? That uh, you just felt like that no one really appreciated you being there and really that you'd rather be somewhere else. So we're to take that in consideration as children of God, that we're to be friendly. In the 18th proverb in verse 24, Solomon said, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. If you want to have friends, you have to be a friend yourself. You can't live under yourself if you're going to be a friend to others in this life. Now, let's bring it down to the church level. Have you ever visited in a church that no one spoke to you? And that you just felt so out of place and that you couldn't wait till the church service was over so you could get out of there. And you'd say to yourself, I don't think I'll ever visit here again. Because no one spoke to me. I've even heard people uh, say that even the pastor did not speak. None of the members of the church would speak. Well, that's not been a problem here at Snow Road or since I've been a member here it hasn't. Uh, I've noticed when people come and, and visit that people go out of their way to speak to them and to make them feel welcome and to invite them back to service. And uh, that's, that's what Jesus wants us to do. And we're not to stare <laughs> at folks. Have you been the center of attention when you go somewhere? That I, I know my wife and I went to a, a church one time and uh, we sat down and people up front kept turning around looking at us. And then they'd whisper to themselves. And I can just imagine what they say, right, who they are, right, where they from. And eventually one of them got up nerve to ask where we were from. And they said, we're from Alabama. That just cut the conversation off completely. Like Alabama was out in some wild heathen place. And uh, so <laughs> you see what I'm talking about. We're to be friendly, and if we're to have friends, we must show ourselves friendly. We should show love and compassion on those who are less fortunate in this life, those who are having trouble in this life. In the third chapter of the book of 1 John, and John, of course, being uh, referred to often as the apostle of love, and he said, uh, not in this particular verse, but in another place, he said that the reason that he loved the Lord was because the Lord first loved him. And so he shed his love abroad in our hearts as his people and uh, that we are to share that love with others as we walk this road of life. But he made a statement in the 17th verse of 1 John chapter 3, but whoso hath this world's good, and it was singular, and showeth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? And so that's telling us that if the Lord's blessed us and that we uh, should be willing to share what God has blessed us have with others who are in need. And there are many in this world tonight who've never experienced that kind of love. There are men in this world who all they, uh, through all the troubles and trials of this life, 
They've experienced hardship. They've experienced grief. Uh, they've experienced all kinds of emotions in this life because it seemed that no one cared for them, that no one loved them, that no one had compassion on them. And so when we uh, show that love from our heart and we share it with others, they can see Christ in our lives. And, and I know there are people out there who try to take advantage of you. Most of you have cell phones and how many spam calls do you get every day? And people are trying to take advantage of you. They're, they're trying to get your personal information. They're trying to get your social security number. They're trying to get your driver's license number. Uh, they're trying to get your credit card number so that they can go out and get something for themselves free. I know that exists. I know that there are those out there who want to take advantage of others. I realize that. But I also realize that there are some who need a helping hand in this life. And we as children of God, God gave us a helping hand. When we were lost and undone without Christ, that he reached down his hand to us. He extended his mercy to us and saved us and gave us eternal life. And we are in turn to share with others. You know, I think about the Good Samaritan, how that he uh, helped the man uh, who uh, had fallen in uh, to misfortune and that he was uh, beaten and he was robbed and left beside the road to die. And this good Samaritan came along and he was willing to help him. And when we see someone down and they need help, are we willing to help them? You know, <clears throat> we need to share not only our worldly good with others, but we are to share the love of Christ through our personal witness to others. There's a lot of ways that we can witness. There's a lot of times that we can witness. And I don't know about you, but I'll just confess mine. There have been many times that I've been in a hurry, and I, I've, I've let those, a lot of those opportunities pass me by. And we get busy with the uh, everyday uh, affairs of this life, and we think about, well, you know, I don't have time to do that. What if Jesus had not had time to leave heaven and come and die for me? Where would I be? I'd be burning in hell. And so would you. So we're to take the time to share the love of Christ with others. Paul wrote in the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So he had a great desire to see his kinsmen come to know Christ as Savior. And wherever Paul went, he was willing to share the gospel with others. And I know many times maybe when we share the gospel with someone, that uh, they'll not be receptive. There'll be times when uh, they'll not want to listen. Seed that are planted will eventually sprout in most cases. And you never know. I've had people to come to me, and I'm not saying this boastfully, but I, I'm saying it as humbly as I know how. I've, I've had people to come to me and say, do you remember me? And sometimes I, I do and sometimes I don't. If it's been many years and I only saw them one time, well, I probably would not re at least remember their name. I, might, I hardly ever forget a face, but uh, sometimes I don't remember names when I don't see people for a long time. And they'll come to me and say, well, I'm so-and-so. And you preached revival in our church back several years ago. And I was saved, but I didn't make a profession of faith. I've had that happen more than once. And so we can plant seeds with people 
We can tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ and whether they accept him at that particular time or not. Of course, our hope is that they would, that they wouldn't go any further without trusting Christ as their Savior. But it may be that it'll take years sometimes for that seed to sprout and bring forth. I read a story one time about, I don't remember uh, the classification of, of the bomber, but it was a bomber that crashed uh, in World War II in the Army Air Corps. That was before the United States Air Force was organized. So it was the Army Air Corps. And it crashed in this area where it snows a lot. And they never did know what happened to the plane. They knew they lost a plane, but they didn't know where it was. And years later, Back in the late 50s or early 60s, someone who lived in that area found that plane. And they went in and found that most everything was still intact, just like it was in World War II. And they went up to the area where the pilot and the co-pilot would sit, and they found a thermos with coffee in it. And they said, you know, that coffee was still good. After all those years, it had not putrefied. I guess the cold conditions had preserved it down through the years. And as we think about doing for Christ and, and having the desire to see someone saved, that the word of God will always be preserved. It's not going to go bad. It's going to be like that coffee in that thermos. It's still going to be good. The blood of Jesus Christ is always going to be good. Human blood has a shelf life. And it needs to be used by a certain date or be disposed of. But the blood of Jesus Christ <laughs> is pure forever. And it will cleanse our never dying soul. So Paul had a great desire to see others come to know Christ as their Savior. Not just the common man who he met on the street. Not just those who were attending church where he preached. Not just those that he ministered to on the mission field. But he had a desire uh, to see even kings and governors and those in places of authority come to know Christ as their Savior. Do we have that desire? Have we lost a lot of that zeal to see folks come to Christ? Well, the, Jesus taught us that if a man smite us on the cheek, to turn to him the other also. And I've often thought about when Jesus taught that, what the people were thinking when he said it. I mean, Lord, if someone walks up and gives me a big old smack in the face, that I'm not to return the favor? You know, they asked Jesus on one occasion, how much we are to forgive. One man will know seven times he was to be forgiven. Jesus said, I say unto thee not seven times, but seventy times seven. Unlimited forgiveness is what Jesus was talking about. So if, if someone does wrong to us, you know, we had a Sunday school lesson about that this morning. We're to do good for evil. We're not to do evil for good. And we're not to do evil for evil. And as the old saying goes, I've heard all my life, you kill my dog, I'll kill your cat, tit for tat. And I, I've seen that happen some down through the years. But 
as I think about what Jesus taught there, and you know, a person doesn't have to literally smite you in the face for you to turn the other cheek. Words are one of the most effective weapons that we have. The tongue can be sharper than a sword. The tongue has many receptors on it. And it's probably one of the most, I'd call it, touchous organs in our body. Now you bite your tongue, you're going to feel some pain for a while. If you bite it hard enough, you'll see some blood running out. I don't want to get gross tonight, but, but that's just the way it is. But with those receptors, we're able to taste. Would you enjoy eating if you could not taste your food? You know, they say that's when they first came out with the COVID, they said, you know, you'll lose your taste and your desire for food. I guess I'm different. I, I've been told all down through the years that that's the same with the common cold. Well, uh, COVID is in the same family as a common cold, if you didn't know it. It's a virus, just like a cold. I've never, in my 75 years, lost my taste. I've had the flu several times. I've had the pneumonia. I've had COVID twice. I've never lost my taste. You can look at me and tell that, can't you? And I still enjoy eating those things that are tasty. But I've thought about sometimes, what if I couldn't taste those things? I'd probably lose a lot of weight. There's some things to me that I just soon get out and graze with the cows on the grass is to eat. Because to me, they have no taste. And other people scarf them down like hamburgers. But the tongue is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. And if we're not willing to turn our cheek and someone smites us with their tongue verbally, then we have to confess it to God. In First or Second Corinthians, rather, in chapter 12, Paul spoke about God's grace being sufficient for every need. God told him, my grace is sufficient for thee. He had experienced many things in life, but one of the most difficult things that he ever experienced was when he got caught up to the third heaven and saw things that were not lawful for a man to utter, and God would not allow him to share what all he'd seen in heaven. He said he besought the Lord thrice to remove that thorn in the flesh. The Lord didn't remove it, but he gave him grace to deal with it. Sometimes the Lord won't remove that thorn in our flesh. I've heard people say, oh, so-and-so's my thorn in the flesh. But said, I guess God will give me the grace to deal with it. Well, he will. Then as members of the Lord's church, we're to resist the temptation to stay out a church or lay out a church. It seems as though, and you may say, as you've often heard me say on Sunday night when I teach or preach something, and, you know, you preach to the choir because we're here. And I appreciate you being here. I really do. But <clears throat> think about what the scripture teaches concerning 
our faithfulness to the house of God. And we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Speaking of the house of the Lord is a manner of some is. And there's a reason for that. He said, so much that we're to exhort one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The strength in being able to exhort and encourage one another as people of God. For you see, Satan is out trying to discourage us. He's out trying uh, to hinder us and place roadblocks in our way of serving him. And if he can get us to lay out of church, he's won a great battle. He's not going to win the war, but he's won a great battle. So as members of his church, we're to be faithful to his church. Did you know the church is the bride of Christ? A man is to be faithful to his wife. She should be the center of his affection. She should be the one that he is loyal to. And he's not to have roving eyes and looking around for other women. He's to remain loyal to her till death, and she's to remain loyal to him to death. That's what the Bible teaches. That a man and woman become one in the eyes of the Lord. And I know someone might say, well, what if a spouse is unfaithful? What if a spouse leaves their spouse? Well, you can find all sorts of different scenarios. But then I'm, t I'm telling you what the Bible says. And just as a man is to be faithful to his wife, and the Lord compares, especially the Apostle Paul and Peter to some extent in his writings, the church to the bride of Christ, or to a bride, because the church is the bride of Christ. And if a man's faithful to his wife, and he's a child of God, he needs to be faithful to his church. Because she is the bride of Christ. People are missing so much today. And we've all heard about that uh, church attendance is down in the United States. It's down tremendously from what it was just a few years ago. People are not seeing the need to come to the house of the Lord. And I say to those of you who are listening on uh, Facebook and YouTube that <clears throat> you need to be faithful to the church as well if you know Christ as your Savior. You're to be faithful to your home church, wherever it may be. And I would encourage you to do so because it'll be a blessing to you. It'll be the blessing to the church where you're a member. When you're faithful, be a blessing to your pastor if you'll be faithful. And it'll also be an inspiration to the young people in church. It'll be a, uh, you can let your light shine and others can see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. But Satan wants to give us or tempt us to lay out of his house. And as church members, we should be faithful attend his house now just for a few moments let's take a look at the status of those who are lost there may be something in your life that you don't understand what's going on And it just may be that you've never accepted Christ as your Savior. And there may be some listening to this message tonight. Somewhere in this world, and I don't know where all this message goes. I know that uh, I've heard reports from 
Korea and the Philippines and Mexico and Canada and various places where people listen to this service. People all over the United States. And <clears throat> if there's something missing in your life and you say, well, I'm a church member. That I joined the church on such and such a day. I was baptized. And, but there's just something missing in my life. And I can't quite put my finger on it. And it seems as though I don't have any spiritual stamina. It seems as though that I don't have the strength to cope with the things that I have to deal with every day in my life. Would you stop and take inventory? And number one priority is to know that you're saved. That may be your problem. If you don't have what you need, you may not be saved. And you say, preacher, you're judging. No, I'm not judging. There are probably people listening to me I'll never meet in this life. So I don't know your situation. But God does. Now I mentioned to the men in our prayer breakfast this morning. I heard a man the other day on the radio. He said he was visiting at a state fair. I won't, or a county fair rather. And I won't mention the state. But uh, he said there was a booth, you know, booths for the different vendors who came to the fair. He saw this one booth, and uh, it was by the Satanist church. And they had a big sign over their booth that said, Come in, and we'll unbaptize you. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? There are two things you cannot be. You cannot be unborn and you cannot be unbaptized. It's impossible. But nevertheless, Satan has the boldness to stand and make these kinds of declarations. And he said he saw one man go in and he didn't explain all about the unbaptizing part of it, but he said when he came out, he and the guy that supposedly unbaptized him said, praise Satan. You know, something's missing in that man, both of those men's lives. And what's missing is salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. When we have Jesus in our heart Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Satan is powerless under the mighty hand of God. If God was so a mind, he could smash Satan down with his fist. That'd be the end of him. But he has something even worse in mind. He's going to burn in the lake of fire forever and ever, and he won't be able to escape. And so it's, whether you're listening to Facebook, watching on Facebook, YouTube, or whether you're seated here in this congregation tonight, if there's something missing in your life and you don't know what it is, ask the Lord to help you to understand what it is. And if you're lacking salvation, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, perhaps you went through all the motions to walk the aisle and shake the preacher's hand and be baptized and you're under the illusion that you're saved because you did that. That's not salvation. You can walk the aisle or you wear the carpet out. You can shake my hand till it's sore. You can be baptized so many times till you wear the baptistry out. But that's not salvation. None of that is salvation. It's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. As I mentioned this morning in the message, Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man shall be saved, that he'll have the privilege, he'll have the honor to go in and out. Now, <clears throat> church members should do a lot of things. We should. And the Lord will bless us abundantly if we do. He's not going to force us to do the things that we know we should do. 
but he will bless us when we do. But if you're in need of salvation, no one can feel that need except the Lord. You can't go to the doctor and say, doctor, give me a prescription for salvation, and you go to the drugstore and get it filled. You have to go to the great physician who healeth all thy soul's diseases. And he does a good job of it. How many times have you taken a round of medicine and when about time you finish it, you get feeling sick again? It didn't completely stop your problem. It just kind of covered it up for a while. Joining the church and being baptized is trying to cover up a problem. But if you want to permanently get rid of it, you have to trust Christ. In closing tonight, there's no greater place that a person can come to than to the cross. The cross was a simple frame structure. It was nothing elaborate. It didn't take long to build one. It didn't take long to nail a convicted felon to the cross. It didn't take long to nail Jesus to the cross. But you know what separated him from those two men that were nailed to crosses on either side of Jesus was that he was the son of God. Would you trust him tonight? Would you give him your heart? Would you give him his life? It's so important. If we have a verse of an imitation hymn, anything beyond your heart, you come as we stand and sing.